This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Spencer Brudig. I'm Will Johnson. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. We were shocked. <laughs> we were just really shocked that that could happen here in Clearview. Okay. That something like that, that how could you get from way down in Temple all the way up here to Oklahoma? We don't have major thefts or anything like that, that this is a place that you could come and, and live in peace. You had to know the area because the average person would probably get lost um, in that area. In 2009, 30-year-old April Peace moved from Washington State to Minnesota, bringing her four-year-old son with her. She had a child, um, and she, she was trying to seek custody of her son. Jasmine Caldwell is a reporter with KCEN-TV in Central Texas. She learned about this case up in Minnesota after she started reporting on a separate case in Texas, which we'll get to shortly. She and her son went to live in a women's shelter in Bloomington, Minnesota, and this was after um, she reported several domestic assaults. According to police in Bloomington, Minnesota, that was why Peace had moved there, to get away from the father of her child. Court documents filed back in Washington depict a bitter custody battle, describing Peace as a woman struggling with drug addiction that affected her parenting, and describing the father as someone with aggressive behavior, someone who is in, quote, complete denial that he has issues around domestic violence, end quote. Peace had been granted temporary custody, and the two parents had another hearing scheduled for March 20th, 2009. Three days before that hearing, April Peace disappeared. She went missing. Peace was last seen on March 17th, 2009 in Minnesota. When April's mother, Dottie Peace, first heard her daughter was missing, as she would tell KCEN, she feared April may have relapsed, that her struggles with addiction may have been somehow involved in the disappearance. She said when April first went missing, Dottie believed her daughter had a drug re relapse. She waited a few months to report anything until she found out no one had heard from April. But April Peace never turned back up. And no one has found her body or know her whereabouts since. In 2019, a decade after April Peace went missing in Minnesota, and about a thousand miles away, Another young woman disappears from the central Texas city of Temple, 28-year-old Jenna Scott. Jenna Scott was just a girl from Temple. Um, she had one child, um, very close to her family. From what her family s told us, Jenna Scott um, was a drug user, but she had turned her life around. Um, she was going to school to be a nurse, um, and she was just like a really family-oriented, nice person, even though she had a past, but she was trying to straighten up her life. On Thursday, January 3rd, 2019, Jenna had been hanging out with a close friend of hers, 32-year-old Michael Swearingen, who would also go missing. They were not a couple. Um, they were just really, really close friends who have known each other for a very long time. The two friends were over at Swearingen's house in Killeen, Texas that night. According to Temple Police, they were last heard from at about 3 a.m. the next morning, January 4th. Jenna's family would first hear the two were missing the following afternoon. Friday afternoon, when um, one of Michael's friends came over and asked us if we'd seen them. Uh, we filed uh, missing persons reports um, that evening. Uh, we my wife and I, Karen, filed a missing report for Jenna, and Michael's mom, Deborah, uh, filed a missing report for him on Friday evening. Jenna and Michael hadn't given any indication to friends or family that they might be leaving town or out of contact for an extended period of time. We just really don't know. Um, we just know that they're missing. You know, maybe we can offer the best and that, you know, they did something spontaneous and, and just took off, which, you know, we might not like that. <laughs> might be a little angry about it, but that's our best hope. And, of course, the worst outcome is what, you know, what's, you know, they aren't with us anymore. We don't know. Or they could have been kidnapped. I mean, at this point, anything that we would think would be speculation. We just know they're missing. It's not hard to imagine a couple friends skipping town and getting away for a few days without telling anyone. But there were some clear signs that this wasn't that. That weekend, Jenna Scott, um, Jenna Scott's daughter was having a birthday party, a big birthday party. Um, but Jenna Scott did not show up. So that was a huge red flag. Why would she throw a birthday party for her child, you know, and, and not show up? So that was a huge red flag for the family. Another red flag? The day after the two friends disappeared, the car they'd been driving, Michael Swearingen's gray Hyundai Genesis, turned up in Austin, Texas. Which is about about an hour away from the Temple, Colleen area. So that was a red flag because there was no, there was no talk of Michael and Jenna going to Austin. So it just didn't make sense why the car would be there. But Swearingen's mother, Deborah Harrison, thinks they were never there. I don't, I don't think they went to Austin. And I know he did not go to that area of town. And still, there were a few more things that didn't make sense to Michael Swearingen's mother, who quickly said she thought her son and Jenna had been abducted. Deborah believes they were taken exactly a week ago, Thursday night, at Michael's house. She says his dog was in its crate for hours, which she says Michael would never do. And the alarm system had been going off. His security system was on, uh, but there's some footage from the cameras that, that uh, is missing that they're... They're trying to get. And while the investigation is still ongoing, Deborah is asking for the community to keep Michael and Jenna in their prayers. He's just got to be found. You have to find him. 
As both families tried to figure out what could have happened, who might have wanted to harm Jenna or Michael? One person, one man, came to mind. They knew that Jenna Scott had a previous relationship, you know, with this guy, and it was just a volatile relationship. And they knew that if Jenna would have gone missing or if something um, would have happened to her, it may have been him. While reporting on this case, Jasmine Caldwell first heard about this ex-boyfriend from Jenna Scott's brother. So I asked her brother, you know, the name, and he said, you know, it's he, he didn't tell me the name at the time. What he said was, he is a, a former MMA fighter who helps women defend themselves. So um, immediately I just start, you know, kind of asking around and going, uh, looking, searching on Google. And, you know, I saw, I think it was the newspaper did a story about this man who was helping women defend themselves by taking these like MMA fighting type classes. And, you know, I just put two and two together. I asked the brother, I said, Without, if I tell you his name, will you tell me? And I said, is it Cedric Marks? And he said, yes. So that's when Cedric Marks first came on my radar. Cedric Marks was a 44-year-old fitness trainer and former professional mixed martial arts fighter who'd had a previous relationship with Jenna Scott. When Marks found out his name was coming up in relation to this missing persons case, he actually contacted KCEN to try to clear his name. So yeah, he sent an email trying to um, say that he was innocent and that Jenna Scott was the one who was violent and that she was crazy and he was trying to escape her and leave the relationship. So through that email, I called him. Basically what Cedric said is that the first thing he said was he had absolutely nothing to do with the disappearance of Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen. He was in an unknown location. Like he, he told me that he was no longer in Texas, but he wouldn't tell me where he was at. You know, out of fear of, you know, I was the media, him thinking that I would call and tell the police where he was at. So he didn't tell me his location. He just said, I'm no longer in Texas. And I had, I had nothing to do with the disappearance of Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen. Court records show that Cedric Marks and Jenna Scott had a volatile history, marked by 911 calls and allegations of violence. On July 27th, 2018, just over five months before she went missing, Jenna Scott had filed a protective order against Marks, in which she described specific incidents of physical abuse and a mounting fear for her and her daughter's safety. In the document, Scott says, quote, I'm terrified of this man. I need to be protected from this man, end quote. A month and a half later, a judge dismissed that protective order for reasons that are not clear. On the phone with Jasmine Caldwell, Marks would point to Jenna's legal troubles in the past and claim that she had been the source of their problems, not him. He was really trying to show me and kind of turn this around and show me that Jenna was the aggressor, not him. He, you know, also said that he didn't know who, you know, would have kidnapped her or taken her, but he kind of thought that maybe she left on her own free will. Almost immediately after this interview, Marks would be arrested in Michigan, where he was living at the time. But the charges weren't directly related to the missing persons case in Texas. A little bit after I spoke to Cedric Marks um, on the phone, he was arrested. Um, but he was arrested on burglary of a habitation with an intent to commit other felony charges. And the reason why he was arrested for burglary of a habitation is because Jenna Scott reported that someone broke into her apartment complex in August of 2018. Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen were last seen in central Texas. Cedric Marks was arrested up in Michigan. And then the following week, a third state comes into the picture when Jasmine Colbell learns investigators have been searching a property in the town of Clearview, Oklahoma. It's a small town in Oklahoma. And I mean, it's small, so small that pretty much everyone there is related to each other in some way, shape or fashion. Um, everyone knows everybody. I mean, anybody who comes through the town, everyone will know. According to the Oklahoma Historical Society, Clearview is one of Oklahoma's 13 remaining historic all black towns towns built by former slaves after the Civil War for mutual protection and economic security. And it's still a small, tight-knit community today, a town where surprises aren't the norm. It happened in our town, we would know it <laughs> real soon if it was someone, because we know everyone in this town. But Clearview is about to find itself at the center of this missing persons investigation. Investigators had received information leading them to a largely abandoned property in the area. Now, police in Oklahoma say they've been at the home for multiple days, searching about 100 square yards and say they found what appears to be a secret grave. That secret, shallow grave contained two bodies, soon identified as the two missing friends from Temple. Medical examiners um, said that Michael Swearingen was strangled and Jenna Scott's cause of death was homicidal violence. One of the questions on everyone's mind was why here? Why were the bodies buried on this deserted property in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma? We were shocked. <laughs> we were just really shocked that that could happen here in Clearview. Perfect. That something like that, that how could you get from way down in Temple all the way up here to Oklahoma? We don't have major deaths or anything like that, that this is a place that you could come and, and live in peace. You had to know the area to know where to dump, you know, bodies, because the average person would probably get lost um, in that area. Someone familiar with that, that, that town knew where to put the bodies. To call Clearview a small town is maybe an overstatement. It's the kind of small town that people who are from small towns would call a small town. It's a town with a population of about 60 total. Among those 60 or so residents, 
are relatives of Cedric Marx, people who say they knew him, that he would have been familiar with the area. Some even recall seeing him at a family reunion there the previous fall. We, we, we know him. We, we've seen him. We, he's attended our family reunions and everything. We know his, his, his dad grew up here in Clearview. So we know him. Yes, we do. We have a family reunion every year, once a year in September, Labor Day weekend. It's, it's his family who, who pretty much own pretty much the town. Um, so it was just, it was crazy. Yeah, Six, a town of 60 people, small. Everyone know each other. Everyone is pretty much family. Marks, already facing those burglary charges in Michigan, is quickly named a suspect in the deaths of Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen. His name is Cedric Marks. Here are his connections. He used to date Scott. In fact, he's also been arrested for breaking into Scott's home in Temple. Scott was friends with Michael Swearingen. The bodies were found in a rural part of Oklahoma, the same area where Marks has family connections. On Sunday, February 3rd, 19 days after the bodies were discovered in Clearview, warrants are issued for the arrest of Cedric Marks on murder charges. And authorities set up a transport to take Marks from Michigan all the way back to Bell County, Texas, to face those charges. When they picked him up and, and put him on that van, he should have never he should have never gone anywhere but Bell County. This is Ray Kerwin, one of the transport agents tasked with bringing Marks down to Texas. But it wasn't just going to be Marks on that transport van. There were other inmates with other destinations. Something Kerwin says he and the other agents weren't so sure about. He was accused of two murders, maybe three, and they were going to have to put him in a van with nine other inmates. And they didn't. They said that's not a good idea because he had made all kind of threats. According to Kerwin, management had the transport agents put a device called a black box over Mark's handcuffs for added security. A literal box that covers up the keyholes, making sure Mark's couldn't pick at it to try to get the cuffs open. But when the van makes a stop at a McDonald's just north of Houston, Mark sees a different opportunity. One of the agents opens the back door of the van so the inmates can get some fresh air. And Marks makes his move. Cedric Marks, all he had to do was kick the gate and it came open. And he just simply stepped out and walked away. <laughs> I mean, it was just that simple. It was no big, there was no, you know, Houdini trick to it or anything. It was just junk equipment and uh, a pickup that shouldn't have been made. The agent watching the van decides he has to stay with the remaining inmates, letting Marks run off. Once that door got kicked open, Chase and Cedric Marks down would have left, uh, would have left that door wide open for the other nine to run off. Cedric Marks was gone, still handcuffed and on foot, but no one knew where. There was an accused killer and trained professional fighter on the loose. It sounds like something out of a movie, and Conroe police aren't willing to give up much. Now take a look at this new video of Marks after he escaped. Now you can see him on the surveillance camera walking by a building here. We have air support, canine tracking dogs from uh, TDCJ, uh, and multiple ground units searching the area. Our primary concern is for the safety of our community. Deputies urge people to stay inside during the escape. Not only is Marks accused of two murders, he is also a trained MMA fighter, and his criminal history goes back three decades. More than 100 officers from every nearby law enforcement agency is called in to help. Police search high and low to find him using helicopters, canines, and drones. Nine hours later, the search would come to an end. Um, eventually, after the search, they ended up finding him hiding in a dumpster near the McDonald's. The 44-year-old spent nine hours on the run in Conroe, which is north of Houston. Police say they found him hiding in a trash can. Officers found Marks hiding in a 55-gallon trash can outside a home along Windswept. That's less than a half a mile from the McDonald's parking lot he ran away from. Marks surrendered without incident, and police took him back into custody. The parents feared he would escape for good. He's not, not, not one to be underestimated, so he's capable of almost anything. I can't say on the air what I actually thought, but it was, what else can it go wrong? But local officers and deputies did track him down in less than 24 hours later, Mark sits in Bell County Jail, awaiting his trial. The fact that they called him as, as quickly as they did was, was critical. It's just a relief to know that he's, he's back here and charges have been filed. Back in Bell County, Texas, Marks was finally charged with capital murder in the deaths of Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen. And he wasn't the only one. A suspected accomplice, an ex-girlfriend of Marks named Maya Maxwell, was also charged with capital murder and tampering with evidence. According to police, it was Maxwell who led them to the location of the bodies in Oklahoma. And that's not all police say she's told them. We now know where and when Cedric Marks allegedly killed Michael Swearing, Jenna, Jenna Scott. We find out that Maya Maxwell, who is another one of Cedric Marks' girlfriends, um, have been informing the police about what happened. Um, what she says happened is that the murders took place at Michael Swearingen's home. And we know he had help covering it up. Previously, Temple PD said the victims were last heard from Friday, January 4th, but it turns out they were already dead by Thursday. We know this because Maya Maxwell, the woman who had originally confessed to moving the victim's car, had actually confessed to a lot more than that. The documents says Maxwell also helped bury the victims, transport the victims, and that she was present when they died. She said Marks took them into a house in Colleen and separated them. She told police Marks entered the room where Michael Swearingen was located, and when he left that room, Michael Swearingen was deceased. She said he did the same with Jenna Scott. After Marks was charged in Texas, police up in Minnesota named him as a person of interest in the 2009 disappearance of April Peace, the woman who disappeared from a women's shelter in the midst of a custody battle. 
Cedric Marks was the father. Now another woman Marks had a relationship with went missing several years ago. Her name is April Peace. Peace had a son with Cedric and went missing back in March of 2009 in Minnesota. Officials in Bloomington, Minnesota say it was Marks April Peace was trying to get away from when she relocated from Washington to Minnesota. In March of 2020, Marks was charged with second-degree murder in the death of April Peace, whose body has still not been recovered. Since his short-lived escape in 2019, Cedric Marks, now facing charges in three murders, has been in the Bell County Jail in Texas, awaiting trial. She had a life, and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer, and it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Une Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson, along with Reed Redman and Spencer Brudig. Reed, this case has, like, so many ins and outs. It's crazy, first of all, that he escaped in the way that he did. And then, you know, luckily they caught up with him, what, 24 hours later in the garbage can? Yeah, it was, it was within 24 hours. I think it was actually nine hours later. But um, yeah, yeah, it was wild to hear that transport agent come out and say, um, after the fact, you know, we shouldn't have done that trip. We shouldn't have had him in that van with other inmates. There was just too much risk to try to, to, try to do that transport all the way from Michigan to Texas. I wonder, I don't know, it just reminds me of like, you know, some movie, although it's a terrible real tragedy involving multiple murders. But does he like get out of the handcuffs that he has on? Do we know? So he, he was still in the handcuffs when they found him in that trash can. Um, and they actually had that, that black box device over the keyhole. So they were really secure with the handcuffs, but he was able to bust out of the van and, and get away um, with the cuffs and all. You know, Reed, I, I thought a really interesting detail was the fact that this small town in Oklahoma is connected to this. And, and the idea of traveling you know, hundreds of miles to dump bodies in a town that you know I, his family essentially kind of owned or were longtime residents there, it, th those bodies may not have been found if it weren't for the other person uh, arrested in connection with those murders, Maya Maxwell, right? And and what happened to her? Yeah, so she she was also charged with capital murder. She's still awaiting trial, as is Cedric Marks. And uh, one of the interesting things that's happened since is that Cedric Marks has continued to exchange letters, and he's actually done a phone interview with Jasmine Caldwell from behind bars. And one detail he's divulged is that the alleged accomplice, Maya Maxwell, according to him, was pregnant with his child. And she's given birth from behind bars, and that child, at least as of early 2019, was in the custody of the state. And it wasn't clear at that point whether the child would be given to her family, to, to Marx's family, if, if he is indeed the father. We, we don't know. So, Reed, you begin with the story of April Pease. And my understanding is that after Cedric Marx is then taken into custody, charged, they go back and find out that he's connected to this other case from 2009, an ex-girlfriend, right? And it's got some similarities. There was a, an accomplice in that case as well that I, I'm not sure if you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't mention it yet, but um, that is something we should mention. Marks allegedly had an accomplice in that case as well. A 34-year-old woman named Kelly Sorensen uh, was charged with second-degree murder in, in the death of April Peace. Uh, but, but like I said earlier, the location of April's body is still unknown as far as the public is concerned. So it'll be really interesting to continue to follow that case and find out what authorities know or what they're able to find out about this case from 2009. Read in the Jenna Scott uh, part of this case. Is there really any more understanding of why Michael Swearingen was killed as well? Was this kind of like he happened to be there? Was there any more information on why he was connected to this at all? Not as far as officials have said publicly. They actually haven't come out and said what they think the motive was in this case. But we know Jenna Scott and Michael Swearingen were hanging out when they were killed. Um, so maybe it was just that was the opportunity that presented itself. They were hanging out at his house and, and that's what happened. And then a detail that still sticks in my mind is the fact that Michael Swearingen's uh, gray Hyundai turned up in Austin. And I do wonder if they'll ever figure out how that was moved to Austin. I wonder if it was made, they tried to make it look like they had run off and, and like who moved that. That's, that's a detail that I'm interested to know in the future. I have, uh, I have good news for you, Spencer. We do know that Maya Maxwell said that she actually drove the car to Austin and dropped it off there. Um, so she actually told police that detail first and was charged with tampering with evidence and then later revealed the location of the bodies and, and all the other information that's now led to her murder charge. Read one other detail that uh, is is very interesting, and you you don't you know read about uh, professional athletes you know all the time being involved in true crime cases. But uh, Cedric Marks himself was a professional MMA fighter that competed for many years, right? Do you have any more details on on his background and and his career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a real deal pro MMA fighter. He fought uh, fifty eight professional fights, according to Tapology, which is a site that tracks all of that. Um, and for a fighter, that's a pretty lengthy career. Uh, now, being a professional MMA fighter in the early 2000s when he was fighting was kind of different than it is today. We've seen uh, the UFC blow up in recent years and produce names like Conor McGregor or Ronda Rousey. Um, Marks mostly fought in a different pro fighting promotion that's called Bellator, which is maybe the second or third promotion in terms of popularity behind UFC today. Uh, and I guess the point in bringing all this up isn't to demonize this guy for being an MMA fighter, but this was a guy who was trained to fight people. He was trained to submit people. And with uh, with 
the alleged accomplice, Maya Maxwell, saying she wasn't present in the room when the victims were killed. I imagine a question that could come up at trial is how one person could physically overpower the two victims on his own, as far as we know at this point, without a weapon. All right, Reed, uh, thanks for bringing us the story this week. A lot to it. And we'll keep our listeners posted on any news of the trial and what happens with Cedric Marks down the road. Spencer, where can people go to learn more about the show and talk with other folks who are listening? Yeah, we've got a, uh, a Facebook group called Inside the Crime Vault. It's a great place uh, to join us, discuss this case and other cases like it uh, with uh, like-minded true crime fans. And if you've been listening for a while, you already know about that, but please join us there and join us here every week. And we'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.